Hello and welcome to episode 67 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings, and 10 years ago, I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret, never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician, Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. And this episode was a massive thrill to record as I'm joined by a man who has been part of the Paul Weller Band since 2008. My very special guest is Andy Crofts, musician, singer-songwriter, photographer. He's got a weekly radio show. He's a record label boss. Heck, he's even made music videos and an outstanding Weller film documentary called One. Not only that, he's also the founding member of indie band The Moons, who released their own fabulous album, Pocket Melodies, in 2020 as well. Back in September, Andy announced that he'd have to stay home this winter rather than head out on tour with the band so we'll talk about all of that hear about his inspirations what it's like being part of the band live and on record and so much more so let's get into it andy crofts thanks for joining me hello it's my pleasure finally to um join you on this podcast because you know you have asked me a few times and i'm always been felt a bit rude because there's always been a lot of things going on and, and you're a busy man you're a busy man and i have to say this feels like i'm entering the inner circle oh i guess i'm the first of the inner circle aren't i know at the moment we have to obviously get into so much stuff i don't know how we're going to cover all this in an hour but we'll see how we get on let's start off where where this love of music comes from from you because it was a really young age i think i'm right in saying is that right yeah well um Music's a weird one because um, as an only child, I grew up raised by my, my grandparents mainly. I'm, I'm my mum, but she had to go out working. So I was confined to my little bedroom and that's where my imagination began, you know. And I, I started off with, you know, the sticks that you help hold plants up with in the garden, the little thin wooden ones. Yeah, yeah. Do you know the ones I mean? The, the little green ones, yeah. Um, yeah. For some reason, it, I, I wanted to be a drummer first. I, so I opened my Beano annual and if I hit the front, page the hard bit I hit it properly you just get a really good snare sound and I used to think I mean I knew nothing about music but all I knew was this sounds like a snare of a song and I want to be a drummer and then I wanted to be um because it looked a bit like a drum I thought I want to play the banjo and then I didn't I'd never seen one saw a picture of one not in, in the flesh and then fast forward a few years I was looking I think this is about 1990 I was only young, but I was looking through the catalogue, the Argos catalogue or whatever, with my nan. And I said, please come for guitar for Christmas. And I got my first little acoustic guitar. And that was kind of it, really. I broke a string on the first day I got it and I got pissed off of it. And I just put it under the bed and I didn't touch it till the day I left school. So 93, I think. And then that was it. That was, uh, I picked it up and I was, I couldn't play brilliantly, but I could kind of play stuff. It was really odd. Did you know then that this was something that you wanted to do in life? This was, you know, the point of leaving school, you're having to think about careers and career advice and all that stuff, aren't you? Did you know this is what you wanted to do? Uh, I knew there was something calling me and I never knew what it was. I mean, I always felt really in tune with music, like the Beatles and soul music and that. I couldn't even explain this feeling I had. I felt like when I heard it, I could hear it more than the person next to me. And I didn't know what that meant. But now I know it's just that I can hear every layer of instruments separately in a song. But at the time I was like, what is, why am I feeling this? So I felt like I had something I needed to do. And I didn't know what it was. At school when they are, they sit you down and they say like, what do you want to do when you're older? Can you write it on this bit of paper? I said, well, I want to be a, uh, an actor or in a band, famous band, you know? And they went, no, no, seriously. And they sent me to an agricultural college for like three days training or whatever. Like, this is rubbish. I hate it. I don't want to dig a garden, someone else's garden. Do you know what I mean? I was just bored. I, was, I thought, how could you talk me out of a feeling? You know, that was that's kind of what schools do. They're like, no, be realistic in the real world. Like John Lennon's Aunt Mimi said, you know, guitars are all lovely in that, but you're never going to get anywhere with it. <laughs> we did all right. We did all right yeah. I had a similar thing, actually. Yeah, my school's advice was, you know, nobody gets to be a radio presenter. Don't be ridiculous. And I did get to do it. You know, that was that was my career for quite a long um, point in time. Although I should listen to the advice because there was no money in it whatsoever. But yeah, anyway. We should talk about Paul Weller. When did you first discover the music of Mr. Weller? Um, officially, like actually listening was when I was at my nan's house. We had one of them old wooden tellies, you know, with the big doors on the front, just because it looked nice. So I opened that and I remember putting the telly on and I think it was the chart show or something. And I, it must have been. Wild Wood was on. I remember thinking, who's that lad sat down with a guitar? I mean, I'd already heard of, of the jam and things like that, but 
I was too young to understand anything deeper than a name or a town called Malice. I would recognise it. But, and then I saw this lad sitting down looking cool playing an acoustic. And it was Wildwood. And I always have this memory of that. But I never saw who it was. The name, I must have missed the title when it came up on the chart show. So I was like, who is that? And, and then I just kind of forgot about it. And then I kept seeing glimpses of this person. And then I was like, it's Paul Weller. As I got older, you know, young teens and that, and mid-teens getting into the mod thing, obviously, I knew who Paul Weller was by then. He was like the god, I guess, of everybody's life and clothes and music. You know, he taught me so much along with the Beatles and all that so it was a young age I, I sort of discovered him but it wasn't until my mid-teens late teens that I really sort of started diving in do you know what I mean it always was the jam though the jam first apart from the Wildwood experience which confused me but I don't know what it is apart from that yeah it was always the jam you know that was my favorite band then um I just went in deeper. You know, like any any bands or anyone you really love, uh, you sort of become obsessed with a band and then you're like, you want to know what they like. And then you read an interview and they say, oh, I like small faces. And you're like, okay. So you go into there and then you're like, oh, I love the small faces. What does Sue Marriott like? Mm-hmm. You know, oh, I like Motown. I like, my, you know, and you go down for the layers. So that's kind of how it started with me. We'll come on to it a bit later on, I'm sure. But there was a lovely moment. I think it was the Wake Up the Nation tour where I saw you guys at the Royal Albert Hall. I think it was that tour where you did art school and you did like the vocals. That must have, was, that, was it that one? Do you remember? Yeah, I remember very well. I even remember what I was wearing. I attempted to wear this suit jacket that was a bit tight. <laughs> and I was going through a fat Elvis period at the time. So I was struggling. <laughs> I looked like a sort of fat crow. But anyway, apart from that, that kind of ruins it for me, that memory. Sorry to bring it up. <laughs> no, it's all right. I always have these connections with memories. Anyway, so we'd been pestering Paul to play something like that or in the city or something. And then um, one day, I can't remember how it, it's been a long time now, but I think it came to the point where he just said, you can sing art school. And I was like, "Uh, okay. (laughs) Well, yeah, of course I'll sing art school. But, you know, in the back of my head, I was like, the fans ain't going to care if I'm singing it. They don't want to see me sing it. But also, I don't want to say no to Paul Weller asking me to sing a jam tune on stage. So it was like a bit of a tricky one. But I think in general, it went down well. And um, he joined in a bit here and there, you know, because I was younger at the time. I think he just felt, you know, he couldn't... um, connect with that song as well as he could have when he was younger. Do you know what I mean? Because it's yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. I've heard him talk about that a few times where it's like, you know, he still has to have that connection to that song. It's not just about rattling out the hits for people. It has to mean something to him doing the music, right? And we'll, we'll get on to all, we're kind of rushing ahead. We'll get into all this stuff because for you, when yeah. you start, when you started these bands, so am I right in thinking Circa was where it all started? Yeah. So Circa was my first band with some very close friends. But then we sort of changed our name. We got someone else in and became the High Drivers. That name is purely because I thought it sounded good. It meant nothing at the time, but it felt good and it felt fresh to us. And then my songwriting started developing a little bit. I started getting a bit better. Kind of hit a wall because I always found my songs were great, but they were just missing something. I started a band with my friend Danny Connors. We formed the on us his songwriting was amazing and i felt like i learned a lot from him that added to me developing as a songwriter he was like the missing link i found it's it's hard to explain Mm. because it's sort of some years of you know you don't think about it and these jigsaws slowly come together but i learned a lot from him without thinking about it and then when we finished that thing that was only like a year and a half long in which we did a lot but when we finished that i was like well i'm at a loose end now um I've got these songs kicking about, did some home demos and I uploaded them to MySpace at the time, which was the in thing. I think this was about 2007 and um, I just uploaded them and I was just like, I don't know what to do here. It, it felt nice, like this weird release, being able to independently put some music on the internet. Like now everybody does it. But at the time I was like, this feels great. I feel like I'm doing something. And then I had this message from Mojo magazine where um, now my very good friend, Lois Wilson, um, she wrote a little bit about this freaky instrumental called Intermission Rag, which was inspired by like, Joe Meek and all that sci-fi stuff. And she did a little bit in Mojo about it. And I was like, OK, so now that's take, I must take it a bit more serious now. So then I went in the studio, borrowed the money off the studio. So can I just pay back weekly because I haven't got a penny? The Lodge studios in Northampton and Robert John Godfrey who runs it. He kindly let me do it. So I went in and I recorded about five demos if I remember rightly and Danny Connors played the drums for me because he was better than me and I'm, I'm, I can play drums 
me for half a song and then I run out of breath. <laughs> you can play the Beano so, <laughs> with those garden sticks still. <laughs> that's all I can play is a Beano or Dandy, whatever. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so I did these five songs. Yeah, I remember I sent the demo to Paul, I think of my home recordings. He said, yeah, come, you know, I really like him. Come and you. He likes one of the songs the most, which he ended up playing on, I'll tell you in a minute. He said, come down to the studio whenever you want. And that's how that kind right. of started. Am I right in thinking you supported uh, him with, with the band before? So the on-offs, you'd supported him on tour at some point. Is that right? We supported Paul Weller on a few shows. We did the album chart show on TV and we did uh, Doncaster or Gloucester. I can't remember where it was, but he really dig the band. And so did Craddock. And after that arena show, I left a message with his record label I said thanks for having us you know I just wanted to because I never got to see them they they done a run straight after the gig which means they've got a big drive so they have to get a head start I was like I never got to say bye dream come true thanks for having us blah 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 thanks for watching us because they watched a lot of it from the side and I saw them all getting into it and then I, a few days later I had a phone call and I was like all right all right mate it's uh Paul Weller I was just like oh shit <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He left a voicemail. <laughs> and I was like to my mates, listen, listen to this. Shut up, shut up. And it was Paul Weller, you know. And he was just saying, no, I really dig the band, man. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Give us a call. So I gave him a call. And then we stayed friends via phone, you know, texting and stuff. And me probably drunk and texting him. <laughs> going, oh, you're the best ever, mate. I put, I'm sure I've done a few of them. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so that's the Weller meeting. Okay. And then from that, then I said, I've got a bunch of demos. So what I said before, I've got a few home demos and I sent him a little CD down, especially made it, printed it out on my mum's printer, got it all ready, you know, trying to make it look cool. That's when he uh, got back to me again. But let, going slightly off the track there, yeah. ironically, I made a, a CD of my songs for him years before. And I think it was at Earl's Court, there was this gig on uh, with loads of bands. I think it was there or... Aston Villa Centre, it might have been there. And I've made a CD and I got to the front and I went, I'm going to get this, watch this, I'm going to get this on the stage. And I went like that, this is my only chance. Threw it and it smashed on the front all over the stage. And um, one of the techs just came over and picked it up and just basically binned it. And I just remember thinking, that was my chance. And I didn't even realise... I know that everybody hangs around the bloody fire exit to see Paul at every gig. But never once did I do that, ever. I never thought I could just do that and see him come in a building. I was just standing in the queue, like, you know, waiting. And I missed so many opportunities. But anyway. Brilliant. I didn't even know that was a thing itself right, either, yeah. actually. I, mean, I need to start hanging around by the fire exit. That's clearly the thing. And these, these texts to Paul when you're drunk, are they things like, can I join your band? And stuff like that then. <laughs> kind of. Uh, most of the time it was like, just wanted to say, I think you're brilliant songwriter you know blah 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 <laughs> trying to be cool about yeah, it but of course yeah, yeah. and at this point do you know that the band is the moons is that even a thing or is it just andy croft's demos how does it work it was going to be andy croft's and then i thought you know what i i haven't earned my stripes to be solo yet i feel like you either start that as a, on your own or you go through a band process and then you know you've get to the point where you're on your own. And I felt like I needed to do a band thing and earn it. So I went, I'm going to call it a, a name and I'll call it The Moons because I'd had The Moons in my head for a long, long time. And when I needed a band name, I was like, what is it? And then The Goons came on a documentary about The Goons and the two O's, I think, sparked it off. And then next minute, I just wrote The Moons, you know, wrote it down quick, put it on MySpace. Kind of like, as soon as you put it on MySpace and uploaded my songs, called it The Moons, that made it official, you know. Yeah, yeah that was the birth of the moons sort of just a bit spontaneous did it have an ethos did it have something did you have a vision for it did you know what kind of music you wanted to to make under the umbrella of the moons is there a theme so they last where are we talking about yeah 13 years something like that is it yeah so it's about 2008 officially we started album came out in 2010 so yeah around then there wasn't ever a vision as such it was more of a case of i need an outlet for my music but my music is it's about good songwriting. It's not about the in thing, you know, this guitar riffs like, ee, 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 like Richard Wall was at the time. Yes. <laughs> but that is about actual songs. And it, I always had the motto in my head that if you, you have to be able to play a song on a guitar, acoustic guitar, and sing it. And that to me means you can translate a song well. So that's kind of been my motto. And that's how I, I just envision the moons, you know, good proper songwriting and um, don't follow the trends, just do my thing. Nice, nice. Now, we're going to talk about how this band, the moons, weaves in and out of your work with Mr. Weller and his band, because am I right in thinking you've got two young children? Is that right? You are definitely right. How the F do you have both of these things going on and the photography, which we'll talk about soon as well, and the kids and everything? Go I mean, this is nuts, isn't it? 
I, it's obviously I love them more than anything, but it is it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I've done pretty mental things and some pretty mental challenges, I guess now, but that, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. It's the constant demanding. Being a musician uh, or an artist, I think you're kind of a bit selfish because it's all about you. You know, it's all about, I need to do this or, you know, if I don't express myself, I feel sick, you know, and, and I feel that, but then you can't, you don't, you're not allowed to feel that. <laughs> no, your young kids don't care about that, do they? It's <laughs> been fighting inside you to be your artistic self and tune into your inner feelings whilst changing a nappy or cooking <laughs> spaghetti on toast. You know, it's you know that's life. You know, I'm no different than anybody else. But as an artist, it, that has been very, very tough, and I do, do struggle daily with it. Really, just a selfish thing. You know, I, I want to write music twenty four seven, and you can't do that anymore when you have kids. It's life. Yeah, you want to lock yourself in a little room with your guitar and your notebook and and just write songs, listen to music, and that. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it used to be, and that's the way I grew up. And being an only child, like I said, I'd sit there with my guitar or a little keyboard and it'd be raining, which is my perfect combination, by the way. We sat by a window and it poured me rain and I'd have my guitar and a notepad or a tape recorder, press record on side A and just leave it rolling and I'd just play and play and play and then turn it over and do the same. You know, all them things are gone now. So now I have to think about like, when am I going to have a bit of time? In that bit of time I do get, can I be inspired? You know, probably not. Yeah, you have to really focus and use that time well. And I've heard Paul Weller talking about the fact that it's like when everybody's gone to bed, Paul's up writing the songs. That's his window of opportunity. And I don't mean that in a bad way. When everyone's gone to bed, that's the only time you get. But then you've got, you're now, then you're fighting being knackered. Oh, God, you know. I just want to go to bed as well. So it's a constant. Yeah, yeah. And everything that's on Netflix and everything else, you know. So let's fast forward to 2008. And as a Weller fan, we ha- we'd had the album 22 Dreams. That album was going on tour and the lineup changed. So we go and see it and suddenly Steve White's not there on drums. It's Steve Pilgrim on drums. Damon Minchella's not on bass. We've got Andy Lewis on bass. And there you are on keys. So talk me through how this comes to be part of the band, because you mentioned the keyboard. Am I right in thinking your first session with Paul was a little jam just with the two of you? So he called me up one day after my random text over the years. (laughs) In one of my random texts, let me just say quickly, I did say, if you ever need a bass player, I've got this lovely Hoffner bass. I'd love to have a go if you ever get stuck. You know, I said, I know you've got a bass player, but if you need someone else, he just said, yeah, nice one, mate. But then a year later or so, I get a call say, from Paul saying, I'm looking for a keyboard player for the band. Uh, are you interested? And I was like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> a keyboard book out. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, cool. Shit, I better learn. <laughs> actually did that. I was working in a music shop. I'm not a brilliant keyboard player, but I'm good enough to play for a song. Okay. And, that, and I said to him, look, I don't know, typical me talking myself down and the opportunity. I said, like, um, I don't know if I will be good enough for you. Because in my head, he had to have a pianist who was like bloody Mozart good, you know. I said, I can play like Beatle keys, you know, that kind of, that's how I learned. And he went, that's what I want. He said, I don't want someone who plays bait over and over the top of everything. I want someone who can play for the song and more importantly, have the sense and know when not to play. I know that sounds weird. I know when to stop. So I reckon I got the job purely um, just being a natural player like Paul. You know, he taught himself exactly the same way through the Beatles and stuff like that. So I think he maybe saw that and, uh, you know, that's what he wanted. And I joined just as they were releasing 22 Dreams. And, um, and I read somewhere that you had to apologise after that meeting. Didn't you ring him up to say sorry? So he, he, I went down and uh, he picked me up from Woking Station with Kenny which I thought was a bit surreal anyway. It's like, well, are just coming over. Like, oh. I was like, all right. Um, he went, yeah, come in. So we went in the car, went over to the studio. I thought for some reason in my head, I thought, oh, I'm going to jam with a band. You know, it'd be cool. And it was just me and him. And I was like, oh, shit. You know? <laughs> so he stood there with his Epiphone Casino, I think it was, or his SG. I can't remember now. I think it was his Casino. Cause I remember looking at it going, Jesus Christ, it's changing, man. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I sat down at the Hammond, I'd only having played Hammond a few times in my life, because we used to have one in the band, but never knew the ins and outs of it. He went, let's just try a few songs, no sweat. So we did um, a bit of Changing Man. It was awkward because I had to play almost a bit more than on the record because it's obviously not always playing all through the songs. So I had to play a bit more to make yeah. it look like 
and yeah, show, show what you can do. Yeah, yeah. And then um, we did all along the watchtower. Wow, what else did we do? I can't remember. We did something else anyway. And um, after we did a bit, my hands were like sweating, <laughs> and I was sort of slipping off the notes like like butter fingers, right? And then I just went, "Should we just, should we just have a cup of tea?" <laughs> yeah, all right. So we went and sat down. We didn't play anymore. And then in my head, I thought, God, that was, what am I talking about having a cup of tea? I'm meant to be auditioning with Weller. <laughs> uh, and I sat around for a few hours and then I went home. And then I, me being me, I was playing on my head. I was like, what? I reckon I messed that up. So I called him and just said, look, um, earlier on, I was shit. I was just nervous and um, playing rubbish, really. And he went, the gig's yours. I went, what? <laughs> and he said, the gig's yours, mate. So, um, he said the accountant will be in touch to talk about stuff. And then um, I went out to uh, Buddy's Diner that night, treated myself <laughs> <laughs> for the first time in years. I went out for a meal and it was, yeah, I spent 20 odd quid and it was good. <laughs> Best meal he's ever had. And can you remember the first night of the tour? Can you remember where it was you were? I think the first night I ever played officially was Oxford. But I can't remember the venue, famous one in Oxford. And you, I mean, you were bricking it in rehearsals. How did you feel? Can you remember what, you, what it felt like to walk out on stage with a band? Bricked it a bit on my own with him. Because can you imagine how surreal that was? Oh, God, yeah. I picked up from the station and then sat with him. <laughs> he stood up next to me and he sat at the Hammond organ, you know, trying to keep cool and not overdo it, you know. <laughs> so when it actually came to rehearsals and playing and doing the gig, I wasn't nervous like that, you know. But I was nervous in a way that um, we all know who's in Weller's band. Everybody who lo loves Weller knows everybody in the band. So I was like, they're going to, you know, there was a lot of strange faces that night looking at like, what's going on? A complete turnaround in the band, pretty much, apart from Craddock. So there was a weird vibe, but it was good. It did what he wanted it to do. He wanted to freshen things up and make things exciting again. And, you know, I'm not talking out of turn to the um, older musicians, but after a long, long time, I think he just wanted to mix things up. And um, that was it, really. And then we were the ones, lucky enough, chosen to do it. They were really special gigs, though, to me. I mean, I love that album, 22 Dreams. I think it's a fabulous, fabulous piece of work. It's really fresh and sounded so different. And, it, and the fact that it's a double album, you got more of it as well. It was always nice, you know. Yeah, when you first play a new, a new Weller album, it's like 45 minutes in, you're done, and you have to turn it, you know, play it again, play it again. Whereas this one felt was like beautiful, and it was so sprawling, and the songs were great. But live, my God, it, it, it had such energy about it, that album. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing was... Because um, I got the master sent to me. After I'd done the uh, little jam with him, I had a master sent to me. And I remember um, I was listening to it while I was working in the shop still, because I just said, like, I'll, I'll, do, I'll finish at the end of the week sort of thing. And I remember hearing the song Invisible on the album. And, and I thought that was just beautiful. And um, just him and the piano, you know, and uh, I remember texting him just saying, that is amazing. Really love that song. That was it, really. I, I was hooked. And then there's loads of amazing tunes on that album. It's a weird one because it's a double album. You sort of don't think of it like a normal album. It's like a almost like a book. You know, it's full of things and you discover new things every time you listen. Yeah, I saw you guys at the Isle of Wight. I think it would have been Osborne House um, and was front row. And it was, you know, I mean, that was terrifying for a start but it was because it was proper full on that night. But yeah, it was brilliant live. Honestly, it was so good. I remember the that well yeah yeah <laughs> yeah slightly scary and at this time like i say you start then you know the moons albums you're recording and we, we get a few albums over the course of what four or five years and you're playing in the weller band so presumably this is like a really inspiring creative time for you yeah it's a weird one it's like inspiration comes in lots of different ways and i'll tell you one of the biggest inspirations is having the feeling of freedom you know one minute i'm working nine to five or whatever doing any old job, whether it's in a factory or a music shop or wherever, right? And then all of a sudden I'm getting paid to be in Paul Weller's band and have this, I suddenly have this freedom. It's like a nod of approval that you're good enough to be you. And it made me feel more confident, you know, because uh, just through the trials of life, you sort of doubt yourself here and there because that's life, you know, having to work every day in a miserable job. So when I had this pleasure of uh, joining I had this feeling of like a freedom and a, a big weight took off my shoulders and it made me feel like I could write, not again, but I could pay a new attention to detail of my songs, you know. Mm -hmm. So it helped in that way. And it made me, I'd already just started The Moons, but it certainly strengthened it all, kickstarted it. 
And it feels like being around creative people breeds creativity as well. You're learning from each other, you're developing from each other, but you're also kind of, put, it feels like to me, like pushing each other to be better versions of yourself in a way. Yeah, well, as a band, and I can say that for the Moons as well, um, we are always, we're always talking about music, especially the weather band, always talking about it, talking about someone we love or something new or something from years ago always always talking about it. we always seriously talking about it you know it's not like an effort you know that's how much we all love it and it rubs off on each other one day paul might come in and go listen to this album and we all listen to it and some of us love it some of us don't or i might say to paul listen to this song like i did this song by le super hamad called black diamond and um he loved it immediately do you know what i mean and things like that so we sort of inspire each other in different ways that's the beauty of the freedom thing i'm talking about you know we all travel together and we all witness things together and live in a confined space on a tour bus you know and that trust is such an important part of being in a band as well isn't it and we'll talk about how the sound to me has evolved so much even when you talk about 22 dreams which is a, a pretty ambitious album but pretty soon afterwards we get sonic kicks and um, i remember the roundhouse watching you guys do that live as well which talking to andy lewis i mean that sounded like a terrifying thing for a start that was pretty ambitious wasn't it that was hard paul said he wanted to have the album you know, let's learn it like the record, you know, and no one had ever heard it. So we were, we're going to go out there and do an album. Yes, that's right. On the Sunday night, the album wasn't even out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit like, you know, got to win the crowd over and then we'll play a few oldies. So, that, yeah, that was a bit heavy going, but it was fun. And, and looking back, the challenges like that um, are what keep you fresh and on your, on your toes, you know. You can't be complacent. You know, so something like that was hard work, but it really was beneficial, you know, made us better as a band as well. And that was the first Weller album that you played on as well. And an instrument I've never heard of. Is it the Farfisa? Yeah, the Farfisa, yeah. What is that? Yeah, it's just a classic sort of 60s sort of organ sound. But I played a few bits on Sonic Kicks and some backing vocals as well. But um, just bits and bobs. You did string arrangements on a couple as well, on The Attic and Be Happy Children. Yeah, hold on a minute. A minute. Where was it? Wake Up the Nation before Sonic Kicks. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've, I've skipped some Wake Up the Nation. Haven't I? Yeah, yeah. Was that the first one you played on then? First one I officially played on. Right. So yeah. played bass on Moonshine, the opening track. Which Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam told me he really liked. Um, <laughs> nice. Random. And um, what else? I played some guitar on Grasp and Still Connect. But anyway, that was, yeah, that was me coming into the studio and not knowing how far I could go, you know. And then Sonic Kicks come along and I was adding more, more harmonies and more bits and bobs, you know. And as the albums go on, more and more and more to the point where I'd, Paul would call me into the studio, especially, you know, to do my thing, just to go for it. You know, he's very open like that. And um, trust me, thank God. Well, also with the visuals. So I think it's Sonic Kicks where you made a couple of the, the music videos for it. And we had more in like Saturn's Pattern. And so Be Happy Children and Dragonfly worth checking out. It's the black and white one. Um, Dragonfly, it's not the one with the naked lady, just in case you're Googling. Uh, it's the other one. How did those briefs come about for music videos? Was that you saying, I'd really love to create something, him trusting you because he knows you can do it? A bit of that. I think he saw me, saw, uh, I've always got my camera and always filming bits and bobs. And I think he just liked what he saw. And I did, I had done this little video I just for myself of a girl holding a balloon in black and white, like an arty thing with a bit of classical music on top. And he really loved that. And he said, oh, you should do a video for me. And it was like that. I'd never done a music video before. Do you know what I mean? And I was kind of a bit out of my depth because I don't know the technical side of things. I know the artistic side. So anyway, I did two videos on a very basic camera. And um, he liked them. But, you know, I've learned a lot since then. We'll come on to the documentary in a second, which was brilliant. And we'll talk about um, your book and the photography and all that. But I have to ask you about one of the gigs on the Sonic Kicks tour. Didn't you break your hand? It was in the old CBG biz. Um, well, it's actually outside. We had this, um, you know, like on film sets, they have these trailers, you know, and uh, we had our one in the street outside the venue because it's now a John Barbados store, but it used to be the famous CBGBs. I was in there with everyone else, probably hyperactive, showing off. And I, I stood up because it's like a posh caravan. I stood up in the corner of the cupboard, uh, this wooden cupboard. I cracked my head right on the corner. I was like, ah, oh, not really... And I was so angry for this split second, like the Hulk, that I just punched the wooden thing. And I heard this pop and I was like, oh, that didn't feel good. And then I looked at my hand and there was this big lump sticking out. I mean, 
I had no idea how the hand worked. In my head, the knuckle had gone right down my hand. <laughs> oh. The knuckle isn't a ball, which is just loose. <laughs> no. <laughs> the uh, medics came and um, bandaged it up a bit and came some painkillers. So I did the gig and my hand was kept catching a bit of ice between my legs on the floor. So I was playing the keys and then I put my hand in it between songs like that. And then I had to do art school. So I got up to do art school and I stood up and uh, my little finger was just dangling down like like that, like it had no... It, <laughs> so I kept catching my, my, my finger on the mic stand on art school because it's not a mellow song, is it? But anyway, I went to um, the Roosevelt uh, Hospital in New York the next day where Lennon was taken, unfortunately. And um, they just, <laughs> as soon as I walked in and they went, punch a wall. I was like... Uh, no, honestly, <laughs> they just knew. Basically, what we've got to do is, in American, snap it back into place. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I said, I'll live with the pain. You're never snapping it back into place. I've got a gig tonight. So I left it and my hand blew up like a balloon in the hotel room. It was really painful, but I just left it and it seems all right now. I've got six fingers now. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You talk about carrying a camera around with you all the time and filming bits and bobs. And um, a, few, a couple of years later, 2016, we get this wonderful film called One, an Andy Cross film. And it's basically um, life on the road with Paul and the band. And there's this fabulous opening sequence with Mr. Weller on piano, which is brilliant. Mm. And when you talk like about arrangements and backing vocals and stuff, there's this brilliant bit where you're singing Going My Way from Sax yeah. Pan. And you're all harmonizing. I mean, I love that song anyway, but there, there's <laughs> nothing better when the like all of you are together and you're all harmonizing together. It sounds amazing. I mean, you must know that sounds pretty cool when you do that, right? Yeah, well that funny enough, when we were recording Going My Way, there was this bit and um there was this gap. And I can't remember what happened when we were recording it. And I was doing the backing vocals. It's my turn to do my bit. And there was nothing there yet. And I went, um, with me, ooh, you know, that big outro bit. And then I layered up with harmonies and then it became that bit. Oh, right. Came this lovely thing and they put this beat to it. And um, that's kind of accidental. But yeah, when we do that, um, it just sounds amazing. I mean, I prefer to do things like that more acoustically, like or around the piano because you get to really hear harmonies. But yeah, it's always a special moment. And that in that um, that moment in the one documentary is just the whole thing is very um, simple. I said I'm just going to put the camera over there. All right, so I just rested it and put the book underneath the lens to keep it up. Done. I press record, and then we just carried on practicing. It wasn't acting; it was practicing while the camera was running. And yeah, it's just a real moment. I mean, most of the things in that one thing, apart from the interviews. Are all real. The thing I like about it the most is that I'm not a professional and I'm not, um, I don't like snazzy, posh things. You know, I think I, as a fan, I would like to see, as a fan of the band, I want to see the raw stuff. So that's kind of, that was always my angle on it. That just be myself, just do what you do. It doesn't have to be brilliant because. You know, if it's good, it will carry that vibe. At that documentary, it's all fun. It, by the end of it, I got a bit annoyed because I was like, it's got two out of hand now. It's like, it started off fun, just art eclipse. And then it ended up having to have some sort of... Yeah, then like, it became work. <laughs> yeah, a little bit by the end. And I was just like, I want it finished now. But And I wanted it long as well. I didn't want just half an hour. I wanted it like an hour and 20 or something. It was just more of a gift for the fans, really. Like a it's real brilliant. Gift. I mean, as a fan, obviously, it's great because you see these, you see rehearsals, you see your time together as a band, you see the, you see these bonds between you and your know, fellow musicians and with yeah. Paul. It's, it's really lovely to watch. And um, and there's a bit with Steve Craddock talking about how touring gets better and better. And, and there's this love of being back on the road. I mean, I think that really kind of comes through, but there's lots of sacrifices you have to make for, you know, touring. Some of those tours are really big tours, aren't they? They have been, yeah. I mean, um, a lot we're saying, when you've got kids and stuff, you naturally make sacrifices because, you know, you're not going to see your kids for a bit. And But it's always, uh, the way I see it, you could fade away on a job you hate nine to five and just waste away. Or you can take that chance and, you know, try and do something with your life whilst compromising you know, and sacrificing some things, compromising on others. You can kind of have a bit of everything if you're careful. Do you know what I mean? But obviously it all, it's a domino effect. You can't choose what you want because someone else gets affected for that. Yeah. Hence why I can't do this winter tour. We'll talk about that in a sec because I mean, that must be, I mean, that must be gutting for all kinds of reasons, right? But those friendships you make in a band on tour, 
I mean, those relationships that you build on tour are really special. And you've not really got to do that with the Moons as such as a band, have you? you it's not like this is you're always out on tour with the Moons and fitting out in Weller. But the, the great thing is most of the Moons are now in the Weller band as well, aren't they? So you're able to, to build yeah. those relationships there too, right? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, the Moons, we have got our own bond. It's different, obviously, because we don't sleep on a tour bus, but we've slept in the back of a greasy old van. And it, <laughs> in some ways, we're, we're closer you know, because we stay in the dodgy hostels, you know, we turn yeah. to hostels and there's blood on the wall or blood on the sheets, you know. <laughs> so there's different sort of levels with the Moons and Weller. Well, we're all close and the Moons, you know, I'm close with them just as much, but it's in a different kind of level, you know. Yeah. The Moons is a much more down to earth, realistic, you know, we carry our own amps in and out of the venue and, you know, all that stuff. In the Weller world, obviously it has to have a certain level of, you know, quality is Paul Weller, you know, you don't mess about. So I get to benefit of not having to carry my amp, you know, bits and bobs in and out the building and get to do other things like bond with the band, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you mentioned the collaboration and the and how your involvement in the, um, the work with Paul has kind of ramped up over recent years. Let's touch on True Meanings because you, there's this song that started it all, which was Gravity. And I'm right in thinking that actually wasn't recorded at Black Barn. It was recorded at Air Studios, I think. Was that right? It was. The original demo was at Black Barn. And then um, he asked me if I'd um, arrange a string section, and I'd never done one before. So I made one up, you know, in my head and converted it into keys, which I gave to the, you know, the string players. And then he basically got all these string players in to play it. And we went to Air Studios and sat in this fantastic room. Again, I was well out of my depth because I'm not a classical musician. I can't read or write music. You know, she said some stuff to me and I said, I have no idea what you're on about. I've just made the music. Okay. I mean, the, the girl who was in charge, Rosie, and I was just like, I, I don't know, you know, all the technical stuff. Sorry. But anyway, the strings just sounded beautiful. And um, it is actually one of the best things I've ever done, really. It's amazing, that song, isn't it? It's, it the lyrics are beautiful. You, like you say about if a song exists on acoustic guitar and voice, it works and it works, you know, it's going to work in any other format. But that, I mean, that's just a class above, isn't it? Um, I heard it, I was just like, you know, there's something about this. I don't know. It has this kind of French waltz thing. I don't know what that means, you know, it just had this feeling of a, an old standard. And it's just a beautiful thing. And to hear, like, same with the jam, right? Stuff like that. To hear someone like Paul Weller, you know, you've, you're just like, it's Paul Weller, you know, he's hard, you know, all that. And then he'd sing something like English Rose. And you're like, that's what I always loved about him the fact that he was the working class kid done good. But then he wasn't afraid to show his poetic side, you know. And I think with gravity, that's all comes down to that moment. And it's just beautiful of, of his age, you know, as well. It was just lovely. And the strings, yeah. that's just a pleasure to do. It was hard work in the end, but um, he liked what I, what I shown him, like a rough demo, and he really liked it. And that was it. And it's it kind of was the song that started the album. And how was it working with Hannah Peel? Hannah's been on the podcast um, and she was... I. I I mean, she's fabulous. What a talent. But you collaborated on one of the songs, Old Castles, as well. And then we should talk about other aspects. We should talk about the Royal Festival Hall gigs as well, because talking about coming out of your comfort zone. But yeah, what was it like working with Hannah? I love her to bits. She's she's amazing. She's so talented and she's just like a natural genius. But we didn't really sit down and collaborate. I had my string arrangement. So she would take it and convert it into, you know, the orchestra sort of thing. But it wasn't like um, we sat down and right. I went, right, let's play this note. And no, it wasn't like that. I, I wouldn't know where to start. I just made my part. And then, yeah, she sprinkled some magic dust on top, you know, and then that was it, really. But yeah, she obviously tightened it all up and made it sound a thousand times better. And the other aspects as an experience at a gig, you know, Royal, Royal Festival, and watching that back, I mean, it was a remarkable thing, but you, it still feels a bit like Sonic Kicks in a way where, you're, you know, you're totally out of the comfort zone in terms of you know how you operate as a band where you've got this full orchestra behind you yeah that was another couple of shows which was a lot of hard work because we're playing with string players and i know paul said this before when you're playing with um all of them string players they can't jam they can't go off on one because there's too many of them they can't just improvise it doesn't work like that and if you mess about and if we decided oh let's just go off on one they'd be just sat there like um had to be very tight and very close with them whatever you know pay real attention to stay with the string section and don't lose it so that was that was almost like one of the hardest things for us to do really is to, to be so focused and it's hard as a musician uh, um in a band anyway not to you know like sometimes we just go off on one on stage and uh you know just extend a part of the song Paul decides to jam out longer you know but you couldn't do that so it was hard work but it was so 
good at the end. When we'd done it, I was just like, yeah, we did that. And it, we were really, really proud of it. So take me to a normal gig then. So when, you know, so when Paul decides to go off and jam, how do you know what to follow? How do you know where each other's going to go on that? Is that exciting stroke terrifying? How much of that is just muscle memory or the fact that you trust each other? Talk me through that. Uh, yeah, I guess there's a lot of all that involved, like muscle memory. I've never heard that term, but it's... <laughs> I think I just made it up. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's being together all the time, you know, like on the tour bus and that, you know, you sort of get to... And, you know, after so many years as well, you get to know each other's, not thoughts, you're not that close, not like Beatles, you know, who were together 24-7. We are together a lot on the road. So we can't, we just know our ways, we know our styles, you know. So if Paul goes off into a little thing we didn't expect, then we kind of just know what to do. You can't even explain, it's just an emotional thing, you just feel it. You know, for example, if you didn't feel it and Paul went off to a mellow bit and Pilgrim just went, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> You'd be like, you're not feeling it. <laughs> no, we all come down and then we all rise up again. And I might play a little bit on the bass, which would lead something. Paul then does something answering back and then Pilgrim would do something different. That's the beauty of um, playing live, you know. I love that. So that's my favourite bit, really. And that must be, I mean, that must be so sad to not be able to be. Yeah, the other guys are obviously rehearsing at the moment and you're not there. They're about to go out on tour. How does that feel not being part of the mix at the moment? I'm not going to lie. I'm very gutted, very sad I can't be there. I'm still part of the band. I've been told I'm welcome back with open arms, which made me very happy because naturally I had this thing like, oh, that's it. No, and apparently I missed, so that made me very happy as well. But um, of course I'm gutted. It's, it's all I know for the last nearly 15 years now. I'm one of the boys, you know, and, and if I'm not with my mates, I just feel like at a loose end. I'm very happy that they've got Josh in from the Stripes because he's just fabulous anyway. I'm not doubting the sound. The sound's going to be brilliant. It's just... You know, me on a personal level, it's really hard not to be there. I miss, I just miss all the adventures we have, you know. Yeah. I miss sitting on the tour bus with my headphones on or writing a song as well. The little things. I'd be sat there writing a poem, staring at the out the window. Paul's reading a magazine and, you know, Craddock's writing a summit on a guitar. God knows. You know, I miss all them little things. So, you know, it's, it's a bit weird not being there. And it's I like seeing the photos and I kind of like, like oh, bloody hell. It's what it is. I'm, you know, I can't do much about it at the moment. It's a tricky situation at home, but you know, we'll get through it and then I'll rejoin in 2022. Well, look forward to that, obviously. We should talk about 2020 because, I mean, Christ, what, in terms of output from you, that was a pretty pretty productive year. I imagine a lot of the work came before, obviously, but as everybody else, you know, we were all in lockdown. So not least are you doing the homeschooling and all that kind of stuff, right? But but we had, I think there were like four different things. So let's talk through them if that's all right. Um, first of all, we had Paul on Sunset. I mean, Christ, what a brilliant, brilliant album that was. And I mean, here's a guy who could, let's be honest, probably rest on his laurels, you know, tour the greatest hits for the rest of his life if he wanted to, like many other artists. But here we are, one of the, I mean, some people on the podcast have talked about this being his best ever album as well. I mean, it's right up there but I mean that's incredible to get that last summer wasn't it with Wello it's or with anyone who's been going that long it's so hard for a fan to listen to something new and treat it in the same way as what how they reminisce about the past isn't mm. it like yeah of course yeah Push Party releases a new album you just don't have no offence but you don't have that feeling of like rubber soul you know in my eyes it's like Paul is one of these very very few people like um Bowie David Bowie um who has managed to keep making this new music relevant music which is beautifully written heartfelt and soulful and not just going through the motions he means it do you know what I mean and it's I'm privileged to see all this because there were so many people at, like you're saying at that stage that age in life who's done all of that stuff sold billions of records or whatever it's so easy just to become lazy and play the old greatest hits and just grow old and you know it pulls very young young in young in the mind you know and he um, treats each album with the same excitement as the first you know yeah and you can hear that when he's talking about it but it comes through in the songs and the lyrics are beautiful on that album the whole sound of it is is so fresh and, and it did scream summer as much as um, we should talk about this as much as the moon's pocket melodies there it is uh, purple vinyl what a piece of work my friend I mean talk about the sound of summer I think it, it, it came out in October so it was post summer but it, it felt like sunshine was back again when you put that LP on the reason for that all the colourful 
think vibes on that sleeve and on the inside and that was because we were going through such a great time in 2020 everything was so miserable and um, I just thought we need to add some colour you know whatever that means so I just made a very colourful art artwork for the album and um, yeah we recorded that in Abbey Road Studio 2 I think it's the moon's best album it is it was a tough one to mix I mixed it it's a tough one to mix because um such a huge room and we had strings in there and everything got in each other's mics and so I had to make a lot of sacrifices on that one but in general uh, I think that's the moon's best album 100% I co-wrote a song Tunnel of Time with Paul on that which we sort of slowly worked on bit by bit in dressing rooms around the world I remember he sent me a, a phone recording and said, do you want to do anything with this kind of thing? I was like, oh, okay. I liked it. But even if it was rubbish, I would have said, okay, anyway. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> uh, but it was good. And uh, I felt I could hear the melody sort of thing with him. And we worked on bits and bobs. Just I'd go in the dressing room and it's just him. And we'd just get the guitar out for 10 minutes. And then I'd walk off again. You know, that kind of thing. Right. I kind of arranged it all, you know, got it arranged in the end. And then once on the tour bus, I said, I need some lyrics for this chorus bit. He went, come on, let's go upstairs. We went and sat at the front of the bus at the top, where there's just two seats. He went, right, um, been travelling through a tunnel of time, now I need to get away, whatever the words are. And um, I was like, okay, cool. Do you know what I mean? He just wrote them. <laughs> I wrote um, the verses and he wrote the chorus, but it was his melody in the verses as well. So it's mainly his uh, thing and I just arranged it and tightened it all up into a song. It's brilliant how easy you make this sound. <laughs> as a songwriter, it's easy if it comes naturally to you. And if, it, if you have to work on stuff, it gets hard. But that kind of, lucky enough, that when there was never a feeling of rushing, it just kind of bit by bit came together. And in the end, I think in my head, I managed to tighten it all up into an arrangement. So I did a demo of it to confirm it and it worked. Tell me about the song Riding Man as well. Am I right in thinking this is inspired by Bradley Wiggins, who I had the pleasure of seeing, I don't know if you were part of the band then, you must have been, having uh, because it was post, um, post the Olympics. So um, he, he got up on stage with you guys at one point, didn't he? It's in London, yeah. Um, no, uh, he's my mate, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen him for a long time. During the 2012 Olympics, he was saying how the Moon's album, Fables of History, inspired him and he was listening to it a lot. And I was honoured. You know, his, there's him winning gold medals or whatever and the Tour de France before or whatever. And um, I was just like, wow, what an honour to someone to say that. And then because of him doing so well and he was the face of the time, you know, I felt a bit inspired by him. I just came up with this riding man thing. I had these chords, da -da 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 -da, you know, I had the melody, but um, watching that, it was just as correct syllables. I know it sounds odd, but the syllables fitted. That's how I write, you know, I'll have a melody and then the syllables to a song would fall into place to fit them. And it was, da, 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 he's a riding man. You know, as simple as that. I could really. sit here and listen to this all day. You're happy to do the, the full version just for you clicking your fingers would be lovely. <laughs> the main thing is like, um, the song is about just somebody who never stops, keeps dreaming and wowing people, you know. And I painted this little picture in my head of this person. Originally, my first uh, idea for that song. I had a, an old man riding a real old bike, you know, down the streets of London sort of thing. But it ended up becoming a kind of summery sort of feel. I just felt this sunshine on that song. So it felt, I imagined a race, a cyclist with a racing top on, whizzing past everyone and everyone's like, wow, you know, seeing the number on his back and stuff, you know, and that was it. Well, the reviews for the album were incredible. Um, the, I mean, here's just a few of the write-ups. So a masterclass from start to finish, a journey of glorious melodies leading you through love, romance, nostalgia, regret, and unity 60s inspired pop folk indie blues and soul it sounds like summer like i mentioned was something i thought immediately as when i heard it i mean it's a terrific piece but you must be so proud once of the reaction that got the lp as well i was so proud i mean i did everything apart from the music put it all together myself on my own record label colorama records and um it was like a, a a new start of a lot of things you know i started my la label officially through that album all the we had a, our first gatefold record we did it in abbey road we did it 90 percent live we did a few extra dubs and stuff just in one but day as well wasn't it was that right in a day we had our friends and my cousin do photography mark wilkinson did photography in abbey road with my cousin jack cross and then i split them up so jack cross had the center fold of the gatefold of the vinyl record and then um mark wilkinson had the lyric book inside so I gave, made sure they both have a, had a piece each nice you know it was just an amazing day we were with some some close friends you know Mark Pate and his best mate and a very good friend of ours um, Spanner and the beautiful Tina Hunter who came with us and uh, it was just an amazing little thing you know we had um, some friends who helped us get all this done 
So I always have to say thanks to Rob and Susie for that. But in general, it was just a beautiful day. And that album, I think we were so inspired by the magic of that room. It was always going to be a good one, even if we never released it, you know. And it's got some good songs on it. Old songs, but revamped, you know, brought back to life. It's lovely. It's lovely. And and a lovely appearance from Connor as well from Villagers on um, trumpet too. Yeah, I needed a trumpet on a rear window. I was like, who could I ask? And we just, it hadn't been long since we'd had um, Villagers support in Wello on tour in America and stuff and he'd been down the studio and I was just like so we just put a message to him said do you fancy doing it and he, and he did he did I think he did the trumpet and the flugelhorn he dubbed it for him for us in his little studio but I was honoured to have him on there because I think he's a fab writer musician yeah brilliant brilliant talent he's coming on the podcast very soon as well right we should talk about before you go we should talk about Paul the photographs by Andy Croft's book which you kindly signed so I ordered this online when would it been last last year end of last year wasn't it and it says because happy birthday Dan so it must have been towards the end of last year to the world's biggest Weller fan love Andy Croft so it's official um, I am the biggest Weller fan obviously because you say so um, but tell me how that a book came about was it am I right in thinking the idea came from Paul to turn it all into a book um sort of I mean I've always wanted to do a book I never thought a book would just happen and then I realized over lots of time I'd take pictures of Paul or whatever and as I said I'd show, I'd show him and I'd go that's good you should put that make a book you know, it's kind of just casually saying it over the years you should do a book I don't think he meant a book of him just a book of everything if you know what I mean but when I looked at all of the stuff I've got I thought hold on a minute I've got I could do a book. Originally it was going to be a mixture of Paul Weller and artistic sort of photos, but I thought it didn't make sense to have all of these random photos and some random ones of Paul. It had to be about Paul, otherwise it just wouldn't have anything to it. When the lockdown thing kicked in, I was like, uh, I had this rush in me that made me think I've got to do this. And I contacted a publisher and they just rang me back and said, yeah, okay, let's do it. And I was like, oh, they let me have full creative control. And I just said, I want it like this as you've got it I just said I want a sort of rustic sort of shabby chic paper I don't want glossy cheesy glossy paper I want it to be, have this you know like mini art gallery feeling mm. like a private art gallery and um, they did everything I wanted and I was very happy and it's just a, a life behind the the scenes and for the first time of a band member I guess it's not really that much different I'm not going to lie it's, it's it's just another Weller book but I have been told by a lot of people that it has something has a feeling different which is you know makes me happy all the little notes are great as well and the little you know the little written bits and then bits crossed out and all that kind of stuff it feels really authentic and it feels really um, what's the word like really heartfelt you can feel that through the photos which I guess is the point I originally was going to write about every single photo and I was like bloody hell you know <laughs> it is a lot I'm not writing about every photo I cannot be bothered <laughs> so I will pick out certain ones I like and I'll comment about them because you don't want to read the same one. Here's Paul backstage. Here's Paul backstage having a cup of tea. Here's Paul backstage. You don't. You only need one or two of them, you know. So I just wrote about certain things and um, what I was maybe doing that day. And I have this motto in my head that about being imperfect. I think it's good. So when I'm writing, if I scribble things out, that is part of the beauty. You just leave it. Don't start again because that's lying. You know. You be be honest yourself. You messed up. Cross it out. Okay, so if one of your favourite people in the world crossed it out on a bit of paper and he sent it to you or she, you wouldn't be like, oh, for God's sake, I'm really, I hate this. Do you know what I mean? I just, yeah. Why did he not start again? How rude. <laughs> it is the moment and I think that's beauty. So I left that in. I left any mess, Any I'm left-handed, so I smudge everything <laughs> naturally. Every time I write since school, I'll take it with me. You know? <laughs> There's all smudge stuff in there, and the, but that's it's not an act. That's just how I write, and I, I don't I don't write very neatly. But I felt like that was the way I could be quite honest in a book, you know. Anyway, it went down very well, and a lot of people really liked it. There's a lot of lovely photos in there. Are there particular highlights for you? Are there things that stand out for you that you go, God, I really love that shot? Not least because you love the shot as a photographer, as a man doing the work, but as a Weller fan or as somebody who's in the moment, it brings back memories for you too. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of photos like that. There's more artistic photos that I love that someone else might not. I love the front cover photo. Where was that shot? Can you remember? Let's go. In a hotel, we were waiting to leave and I said, hold it there a minute. Got you. That was it. It wasn't like, let's go for a walk until we get a nice photo. Never, never like that. And then the one at the Ed Sullivan Theatre when he sat in them red seats, it's just something iconic about that. He's got this sort of op art, you know, pattern on his top and hexagonal glasses and he just looks mm-hmm. cool. And it's the Ed Sullivan Theatre, the old place. So that's magical. Um, 
few other ones that are not so artistic and just everyday life is someone came to the studio once with his old car that he used to own and had it all done up. And there's a picture of him sat in the car in his old car he had when he was in the jam or whatever. I like them sort of things. I like um, Paul drinking a cup of tea, casual, you know. It's a tough one because I could be really pretentious and just put really artistic stuff in there, which is lovely, but almost a bit soulless as well. Or I can just be real. There's a sat at the diner, a truck diner, having breakfast at silly o'clock in the morning. I feel like people enjoy seeing them sort of things. There's a picture of the tour bus. There's a picture of Paul in this, doing a sound check, you know, or whatever. The only thing I would say is the documentary one is almost like the visual version of that book, even though it was before. And I'm now on the bass guitar, obviously, but it's kind of like the visual interpretation of my book. So yeah, they go hand in hand, don't the two of them together. And, and you can now buy photos. So us fans can buy the from your shop as well. I'm only doing a selected few and um, they are A3, good size. And the frame is like 20 by 16. So they're a big, big image with a glass oh, in nice. it, big, nice frame. And I'm signing each one at the bottom corner just to keep it nice. And how I'd see it in the gallery, really. I was originally going to do an exhibition and it just never came and never got round to it. So I'm selling a uh, four different images at the moment. They might do with another bunch. They're, you know, they're proper good quality, not just some, you know, standard print. And they're by me and I'm putting them all together. So so there's these kind of dual creative passions going on with the music and the photography. You've always got the camera around your neck from what I understand whenever you're, you're doing this stuff, aren't you? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, and, you know, I'm not going to lie, I'm not doing the Weller tour this winter, am I? So I've got to make some bread and butter summer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah family to feed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fair play. To make the whole thing, including the prints, the boxes, the bubble wrap, the, the frames, you know, you're looking at nearly 50 quid a time for me to whip all that together really nicely. So it's, you know, it's a nice little thing to have. And I'm going to sign it and number each one as well. Okay, well, I'll put all the details in the show notes for the podcast and people can dive in, which will be a lovely just in time for Christmas as well. And um, a couple of things before you go, because I realize I'm way over time here, but we have to talk about Fat Pop Volume 1. So 2021, we had the LP, a very different way of your working because this was recorded and created in lockdown. So am I right in thinking that bits were being sent over email? And, and over the phone and stuff like that? One song maybe, or maybe two. Shades of Blue, for instance, I did in my, my little studio in my back garden. It's the first time I've ever done that. So I did the bass and some backing vocals and that. And, and like record them there and then send them back over email. In general, we don't like to work like that, but that was the situation at the time. So we had to deal with it. It worked, you know, but it was not something we'd want to do often. We like to, it's the, the magic in the room. But that whole album is, I love it. It's an absolutely fabulous album. And it feels weird that that and on send, Sunset came out and you know they never got toured they are now yeah. but you know yeah I read something about Paul having like this whole vision for On the Sunset of how that was going to be toured and it was going to you know be very different I don't know what that was going to be because he never revealed whether whether any of that kind of comes through but yeah it's I mean, a real shame that we've not got to see those live but I think and even True Meanings I don't know that a huge amount of that was toured. You didn't get to play a huge amount of that live, did you? Not really. We did a few. We had to make a special moment of it. You couldn't have that orchestra out, you know, on every night. So we had to sort of make a special moment and have a couple of shows dedicated to that. And, you know, it was filmed and documentary and that. And so it was kind of of the moment. You know, but now we'll just pick songs from it and put them in the set here or there. Yeah. And Fat Pop, I'm right in thinking there was this gap between the two lockdowns at the tail end of last summer where you actually did manage to all get back into Black Barn and play together and, and work together on that album. Yeah, yeah. We sort of went in and um, hung out and it was lovely. And just like usual, if there's some demos floating around, we all just sort of chip in and uh, do bits and bobs on it. Yeah, songs just sort of every time you pop in, something new has happened or it's completely different, you know, but that's the magic of uh, Black Barn, you know, and the way Paul works. There's never a, an exact way you think it's going to go because um, it's very uh, spontaneous, you know. When you go in and there'll be like a different drum beat on it, you'll be like, oh, okay, all right, cool, that's cool. You know, I wasn't, didn't see that coming. <laughs> yeah, Steve Ellis talks about the Black Barn crew um, when he was on and, and this group of people who were there, and particularly he was talking about Stan and Charles, who I met the other night. I met Charles at the Declan O'Rock gig, which was a very lovely experience, I'd say hi, Charles. Um, and those guys have worked with you on some of the Moon stuff as well. So what is it about the magic of that team at Black Barn that's so special? I think it's just uh, over the years and years of working together, we all know each other so well and we all trust each other, admire each other and just care about each other as friends. So, it, you, you know, it's like the dream job, isn't it? You go to work with your best mates every day and then you make music on top, yeah. which just happens to be really good music. 
I love hearing all these little layers that you all add onto each other's song, you know, onto the music, and it just builds and builds. And you can hear just the tiny little things. The brush strokes was how um, Steve Trigg talks about it. It was just a, it's a magical thing, man. Honestly, both from the moons and from Weller's material, is brilliant. It's just, it's just that's the beauty of it, and uh, the fact that Paul is so open with his music. He hasn't got any real rules anymore. You know, like when he was younger, he might have done it a certain way, but now he's like he has his song. You know, the rough guide of it part of it and then he's he's open to just let things build and someone's contribution could steer it in a different direction to the point where he was like unexpected you know there's no way right way or wrong way it just happens differently every time i love that um so we should also i have to ask you i've heard rumors of a solo album being your next project is that right yeah it is it's been on the cards a long time and i've got a bunch of demos and it's just a case of purely having the time to do it I mean because I can't do the tour that means I can't do a lot of stuff you know and um, I can't tour with the moons so I'm kind of housebound I've got these demos and I'm slowly chipping away at them and then when the time is right I will attack that studio and make it and get it out fast because I'm desperate to get it out they're starting to feel old to me already these little (laughs) songs you know (laughs) how much can you tell us about it how different will it feel to a moon's album it's only going to be different in the way that apart from being on my own it's going to be a a lot more musical maybe Uh, just a much more musical record less indie schmindy it's just more I don't know more like inspired by something like pet sounds from the beach boys uh, you know that sort of mentality not just going da, 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 through the guitars you know can have a little bit more depth hopefully well really look forward to it, andy this has been such a pleasure there are two things we have to plug before you go and I know this isn't you asking to do this this is me wanting to do this and uh, mentioning them but one the radio show boogaloo radio yeah thursday nights eight o'clock until 10 p.m on boogalooradio.com that's my show the night train and yeah i'll just play it all kinds of stuff. Mod, soul, rock and roll, hip hop, indie, Motown, Stax, funk, freak beat, hip hop, like sort of old school with Della Soul, Fight the Power, Public Enemy style, you know, that kind of stuff. There's no rules. It's just me chatting shit like now. <laughs> Enjoy me because I do. Um, we've got a nice little following who meet up every Thursday night and we all sort of talk on Facebook or Twitter. It's sort of all just chat during the show, you know, in real time. So it's nice. So come and join us. Love it. Love it. And what do you like about being a radio presenter? Because that's a completely different world again from the music. It's it's took a long time to find it comfortable. As you know yourself, you know, like when you first talk talk in a mic. So at first I was like, hello, I'm Andy Cross. This next song is by the Beatles and it is. a." But now I, I just learned, don't try and do anything. Just speak, be yourself because people are either like you for that or not. You know, it doesn't matter. Don't try and be a robot and pretend to know knowledge about songs if you don't. I'll never talk about songs unless it's the Beatles. I'll just just literally say, oh, I love that song. It's wicked. And then next song. Play them out. Well, you're introducing us to some new stuff as well, I know, because that's something that you all seem to share within the band. And like you said, uh, you're you're messaging each other about new songs that you've heard, discovered and stuff, which comes through on the radio show too. Yeah, it's just, um, I try and put some new music in there every week and new music from my, my record label. You know, Colorama Records. That was the second thing I was going to plug. So tell me about Colorama Records, because Daniel Ash has been on, Teenage Waitress has been on, who's one of the signings to the label, and he's a lovely lad, great guy. You've kind of ramped up the record label a bit as well recently, haven't you? Yeah, um, we're just getting a lot of new artists on there, trying to make things, you know, like a a family vibe on there, because it's important to feel like you're part of something. You're not all strangers. So we've got, I'll just tell you a few bits we've got coming up. So we've had Teenage Waitress and Sun Zoom singles and the Moons and uh, Chris Watson, the guitarist of the Moons. But we've got um, Bliss Williams out at the moment with Tear Away, which is a great tune. On Friday, we've got Tiny Dino with their new single, Still, which should be getting some good airplay, you know. Then we've got Wilderman the following week with Never Ready. And Wilderman, uh, I won't go into it too much. He's just like from musical royalty. His Mum's Carlene Anderson. Oh, wow. It's Bobby Anderson. His mum's Carlene Anderson and his grandparents are Bobby Bird and Vicky Anderson. So if you know your, your funk and your James Brown connections. Wow. Like, wow. It's coming out the following week called Never Ready by Wilderman. And then we've, the following week, we've got Duvet Days, uh, this young girl from Bristol with a song called Honey. And um, it's just a really nice vibe. We've got an, an album by Sun Zoom as well coming out next year. I'm learning as I go along as well. There's no real rules to the label it's just we kind of grow together and just 
That's it. It's just a, a nice umbrella for all these artists to be under, and it's all about songwriting, good songs. Mm. It's, I mean, it's so hard to break new music these days, though, isn't it? So how do you how do you find it? Apart from your radio show, how do you find an audience for these people? Oh, it's it's almost impossible these days. You just got to try and do everything you can, anything on social networks, contact radio, and just hope for the best. You know, it's not easy. There's a lot of competition. But hey, look, this has been so lovely, Andy. I've stolen so much of your time. Bless you. Say, thank you so much. I have two final questions for you before you go. You may know what's coming, but number one, you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life it can be the jam the style council or solo which one are you going to go with um hold on hold on um Tales from the Riverbank oh good one it's just one song that stuck with me all my life and I absolutely love it I love the feel of it it's something I can't explain and uh, the melody yes yeah, perfect that one is that one of the ones where you've all got up on the stools, you as a band and played together? I'm, I, I feel like it might be. We have done, definitely. Yeah, that's always a special moment. I love that bit, I have to say. If that, if that happens, I'm like, oh, this is good. We're in for a real treat. Final question then. Purpose of this podcast is not least to meet amazing people like yourself. And hey, it feels like we're getting closer because the actual point, purpose really is for me to get that interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career. If it happens, what should I talk to him about? What should I ask him? Oh, God. Uh, is, there, is there anything you'd like to know that you can't ask? <laughs> I kind of know everything I need to know. Um, I'd just ask him about, um, ask him what his favourite, I mean, ask him about a favourite Beatles album and why and why it influenced him. You know, what are his favourite songs on it? Why do the Beatles fashion inspire him? You know, because we always talk about things like that. Andy, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, man. My pleasure. All right, see you later. My thanks once again to Andy Crofts. I'll share links for everything that we talked about, the book, the albums, the record label, in the show notes for this podcast. And make sure you head to andycroftsphotography.com for more information on those exclusive prints. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please make sure you follow and do leave a review. It helps us to find new listeners to the show and make sure you share it on your social media channels. You can also buy me a coffee, details in the show notes for the podcast and get in touch on Twitter at Weller Fan Pod or on Instagram and Facebook. It's Paul Weller Fan Podcast. I'll see you next time.